So next up, we are going to be discussing something crucially important, which is breaking barriers and ensuring youth participation in social housing. And we have got an esteemed panel of four panelists, and I'm going to start off by welcoming Debt Funding for SHI slash ODAs, Lindo Kuhle Ndovu from NHFC. Can we give her a round of applause? Him. <laughs> My apologies, <clears throat> Mr. Lindo Gushendovu. Next up, Understanding Project Development, CCG Structure and Implementation. Can we please welcome Ms. Nokolo Jali, who is from SHRA and is a Portfolio Manager. <clears throat> Our next panelist will touch on my success story, challenges, Mitigation Strategies, his name is Mr. Yusuf Ghani, CEO of YG Property Social Housing Institution. Can we give him a round of applause? And last, but certainly not least on our panel, we have Land Acquisition and Release, Justice Naledzani, who is from the HDA. Before I make my way down to the audience, thank you once again for being here. Uh, we look forward to learning from your expertise. And I'm gonna throw my question to any one of you in the panel. And my first question, when it comes to breaking barriers of youth participation in social housing, where else do you guys feel this conversation that we're having in this room still needs to be had? Can I start? Yes, please. I don't know if I'm audible. Yes, you are. Uh, okay, great, sir. Thanks. Good morning to uh, my uh, esteemed panelists on the floor here and also our esteemed youth members from UPA. Uh, I think such platforms really are a great starting point for the NPC to be able to gain exposure. For me, I believe that uh, such participation or such engagements are very critical in making sure that we gain that participation from our youth. I don't know, there seems to be something. All right, thank you. All right, great stuff. All right, thank you. So I, I believe that it's going to be very important, you know, as, as the youth, you know, as we enter into the sector, that we, you know, we, we put ourselves together with the relevant skills to say that, look, maybe there could be uh, an SHI that has been set up by people that have the the background and the skills that are there in the sector. Maybe someone is an architect, someone is coming from a legal background, someone is coming from the property background. But also, maybe as new people, we may not necessarily always have the skills that are required or the experience that is required. So we just need to partner with other stakeholders that could be having the requisite experience in ensuring, but we can still have a majority of the stake in whatever the projects that we do. So partnership with the existing stakeholders in the, in the, in the sector can be a breaking uh, of, of the barrier. And obviously, as the NHFC, there are some concessionary that we do give to these uh, young SHI or young managed uh, SHIs that we can say, look, as a youth-owned SHI or your youth-managed SSI, we can be able to partner and give you such benefits so that we make sure that you enter into the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for all of you today. And I know that if you're audible, the panel is going to be able to hear you as our mic is currently there. So I ask that if you have any questions at this point, that you please let me know. I'm going to take three hands. One. Do we have anyone else? Can I get a third hand? Feels like an auction. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go with you first, sir. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself then. All right. Uh, thank you guys for, for, for hosting this. Uh, my name is Kiko Ogutoni, right? So um, a recent graduated study, um, I studied PhD property studies, right? And my dissertation was on developing uh, sustainable low-income housing. But now I'm a graduate, right? Um, I don't have that much skills because it's been, what, four months, five months since I've been working. And generally, I do want to take the entrepreneurship route, you know. Um, I'm currently in a phase where I'm doing the market analysis. I've been studying the, the, the supply and demand gap and all of that. But now, I don't have the necessary skills. You know, I don't have the competencies that 
one game in the game is developed and I think I spoke to you this weekend about it outside outside too. So um, what my question is basically is how can we as organizations that you guys work with Eric help us um, um, implement our ideas or give us the competency to, to actually implement and you know hit the, the, the rub on the road. Right. Um, thank you for that question. I think fundamentally the challenge that we see in the sector at the moment is that there's a catch-22. We have a mandate to um, invest and dispense funding towards youth-owned entities. However, in the construction field, by its nature, experience is required you know, in construction. We are graded according to various um, uh, sector regulators like the CIDB, your grading matters in terms of the magnitude of the project you could undertake. So there's kind of a gap in between the two. We've got a target that can't be met because of the regulatory environment that we're in in construction. So what that requires, if I, I don't know, I could aim to answer your question is, is it's about skills and knowledge transfer between the experienced and the inexperienced. And that's the only way that it can get done. You know, there's, there's no way you can go from, you know, as much as we are so excited after graduating and you've done it, you've got a little bit of experience, you really want to just jump into entrepreneurship. This sector is such that it's, it's, it's high risk, it is challenging, and without that knowledge and experience, you would be set up for failure. So it's about creating those kinds of environments where experienced entities can take on and guide younger entities, whether through partnership, through joint venture, whatever the case may be. I think that's the best way for us to tackle that gap between the two. Thanks. Thank you. Does that answer your question? So is this if you were to want to deliver social housing, for example? Sure. Right. So I think the best way I would envision, envision it is for it to come forward as if you were to have an entity and you have the intention to deliver, you would then appoint the necessary consultants and team with the required level of experience to demonstrate that level to, to deliver, the capacity to deliver something very important. And in, with the SHRA, as Diawalt mentioned, you know, we've got our support programs that can you know, facilitate that added measure to say, this entity is new, it's young, however, they've undertaken one, two, three, four to ensure that the ability to deliver is there. I mean, amongst some of our existing SHIs as well, you know, they, they, they engage with each other, in fact. They share um, lessons learned with each other. We have some entities that have been in this game for plus 15 years. And when they know that this is a new entrant in the industry, come and visit my project, come and visit and see how we do things. We engage regularly. And what's great about social housing is that it's a joint initiative between the three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local government municipalities. So when we gather at our provincial steering committees, for example, and they share exactly what they've been doing and how their projects are going, it's an opportunity to share knowledge, to share skills, and then to engage further, take it offline and do those kinds of things, visit each other's projects, get guidance, learn. And then of course, SHRA's backing is our support programs, which were so detailed, um, explained in detail, that we provide capacitation, guidance, training. So I think that's the best way to do it. But the experience does matter, and um, it, it, it will all boil down to who you can, whose who's experience and knowledge you can leverage to then bring yourself forward mm -hmm. as an entity that doesn't have experience. Thank you. We have a gentleman over there. Uh, good morning, how are you? Good, thanks. <laughs> I don't know, before. <laughs> I hope everyone's good. <laughs> Thanks for your question. I want to hand over to Yusuf as, as one of the panel members who's here to share his experience 
in you know, being an on entrepreneur in the property sector, and perhaps maybe you can provide some guidance to Sandile. Thank you. No, this seems to be working. Okay. Good morning, my esteemed panelists and, uh, and, and the youth from YIPA and other organizations. Um, as I was listening to the questions, it was actually quite nostalgic because um, that's, how, that's exactly how I started up. Um, I really wanted to enter the property sector and I really wanted to, to do something big and everywhere I went, um, you know, they said, you've got no experience, but you've got no experience, how can we fund you? And, and so how I started, and, and, and it's, it's, it's certainly something I would recommend to any aspiring entrepreneur, is, is, is to go out and get some experience with one unit. And, you know, Sandile mentioned he's got 13 units, I was very proud because we met in the bathroom. And, uh, <laughs> and and I was very, uh, very very proud because there's not many entrepreneurs who can come out and say, look, I've done 13 units already, which is a great achievement. So well done to you, Sandile. But, you know, coming back to my story, I, I, I was, um, I, I explained that I was actually um, doing my articles to become a chartered accountant and my salary was actually um, 5,000 rand a month. And um, 60,000 rand a month, uh, a year wasn't a lot to raise, uh, you know, finance. Um, but but I knew that I, 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 I needed to have the determination to go and do something. And um, if they're saying that I don't have the experience, then I need to go out and go and get the experience. So I went to an auction. It took me about a year to find my first uh, project, which was one house. And I managed to get it on auction for 300,000 rand. And NetBank said, okay, look, he's, he's you know, he's, he's posed for growth because he started the job. He's in his first year of articles. Maybe in two or three years' time, he'll move up from 5,000 rand a month to 13,000 rand a month, for example. We'll give him the loan, 300,000 rand, uh, provided he puts a 10% deposit. So I obviously had to save up for that and cash up all my uh, whatever, uh, you know, Christmas presents or whatever it is I had and make sure I come up with the 30,000 rand. And then I bought that unit. And it took me about a year or year and a half to re renovate it because obviously there was no cash flow after they've given me the 300,000 rand or 270,000 to buy the unit. I obviously needed to revamp it and there's only 5,000 rand a month coming from income and I'm married. So it's obviously a difficult situation. <laughs> so, you know, you put money aside and you, you, you buy a bit of paint and you paint and you renovate. And eventually after a year or year and a half, um, there was tremendous additional value in that, firstly from inflation and secondly from the value I had created and I sold it for 760,000 rand. And I used the difference from that as equity on another house that I purchased. So that took another two years. So, you know, the, uh, the journey of entrepreneurship is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So people are saying, you know, I want to do 500 units, I want to do 1,000. All I'm saying is that, you know, I, you start with one, you really get your hands dirty. Then you say, look, I've got a track record. You go to the bank and you say, look, you know what? I've already done one. Yeah, I, I, here's, here's the track record. I bought it. I renovated it. I made a profit. I sold it. Here's the profit and here's the profit. I'm, I'm bringing it to you. Here's the equity. Can you fund my next project? And then you, you find that they're more engaging in, the, in that regard. Um, and, and, and then I did the second project, which also took a year or two. And, and so now you're talking about a period of five years where you do two units. Um, last year, which is now 15 years into my business, last year we, did, uh, we completed um, 500 units and we're busy building 1,000 units. So what I'm saying is that you, you know, it may take a while for you to g gain that trajectory, but then once you gain that trajectory over a five or six or seven year period, then it would be easy to do 30 units, 50 units, 100 units, 300 units. But one doesn't just walk into a 300 project, 300 unit project because it got, it's got all sorts of dynamics. And one needs to prove to a funder, whether it be the SHRA or the NHFC or the Gauteng Partnership Fund, that there is some level of uh, expertise that I've managed to gain on myself, on my own. And now I've come in, I've sold two homes, I've made some profit, I'm putting it all as equity, now can you back me? And you'll see the engagement is far more different. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got NHFC here, I'm sure they'll testif te they'll be testament to the fact that, okay, look, you know what, here's a youth, uh, com a company owned and controlled by youth, uh, previously historically to this advantage, but it's done two projects. You're not seeing it as two units, you're seeing it as two successful projects, which demonstrates that I've got what it takes 
to go through the motions and I understand the entire process from start to finish, from buying a property to selling it and everything that goes in between and I, I'm here to now grow. Can you assist me? The conversation is far more different, you know. And there was a study, a recent study done in, in uh, Stanford University when they looked at uh, success. What does it mean to be successful? And what were uh, traits that, that, uh, that, that, you know, they looked in children and, 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 and people at university, etc. And what were the traits that came out to, uh, that you could say, okay, look, this guy's going to be uh, successful or this this woman's going to be really successful it wasn't interestingly it wasn't IQ it wasn't intelligence it wasn't family income it wasn't good looks it was grit <laughs> and they de define grit as a combination of perseverance and passion because entrepreneurship let's be honest is very difficult but if you can go if you can go into it and say look I'm gonna I'm gonna persevere day in day out month in month out year in year out there is a guarantee that you will be successful mm -hmm. Great. thank you for that i'm sensing a spirit of passion in this room <laughs> and yeah. i know that we all will certainly be persevering you had a question for me sir good morning good morning <laughs> um my name is Kopano. right um i have three questions right i hope yeah. i'll be able to ask all of them if i can remember all right, my first question is, what are the most important aspects for us, especially youth, to have if we want to be like a proper agent, you know, with Shra, right? Um, that's my first question. My second question is, what else can we learn from um, Shra or the YIPA besides just having to have funding? Because let's be honest, you can give someone funding, but they, won't, they may not know what to do with the funding. You know, there's a whole lot of aspect that needs to be done. So what dynamics can we learn and where can we learn and how can we implement them? You know? And my third last question is, um, what different source of funding are we exposed to as youth? Because we're in a day and age where like, you tell someone that let's buy a property and they're like, no, it's expensive. You know? Um, I, I, I do not have the right credit score to go to the bank to be financed, you know. Most people don't know, um, as that gentleman there is from NHFC, most people don't know about FLISP, right? We need to be, like, um, exposed to such things, like, how can we apply for FLISP? Where do we apply for it? What needs to happen? And all those sort of stuff. So, yeah, those are my three questions. Thank you. Does mine work? Is it working? Can everyone hear me? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kobano. I think as the one panel member from the SHRA, maybe I'll just take your first question or two. Um, but the most important aspects to becoming an SHI with SHRA, it's, look, one thing we, we, we all agree on, and perhaps Yusuf can also agree, is just the, the SHRA requirements are quite hefty. You know, it's a voluminous requirement of, you know, documents and, and things between your organizational capacity, the technical details of the project, and then the financial details as to how you're gonna fund the project, but also how will you sustain the viability of the project once it's complete. So that would be your income after construction, of course, through rental. So to become an SHI, it's for you to tick all those boxes as an organization. and what we have are different kinds of delivery agents. So an SHI, as a social housing institution, that's a non-profit company, an NPC. Whereas a other delivery agent, which is an ODA, that's a, a normal company, a private company, a profit earning company. And then we also have our municipal owned entities, MOEs, but those are entities owned by the municipality. I'll give an example of Joshco. It, it, a lot of people have seen Joshco around the city, They've got developments all over. So your only options would be either to become an SHI or an ODA. Now, my recommendation towards youth-owned entities, especially where equity might become a challenge, is to become an SHI because SHIs do not, they're not, uh, um, it's not mandatory to have equity invested into the project. Whereas as an ODA, which is a private company, because you are active in the private sector, we, we expect you to have 20% uh, equity. So our, our SHIs at least have that burden alleviated in terms of the equity requirement. Now, being an SHI, that would mean then you would have to be registered as an NPC with CIPC. And 
with, with SHRA, all our entities, all our delivery agents, whether you're a SHI, ODA, or MOE, you need to have a board. Mm -hmm. So these are those, it, there's all these intricate little details about what we expect from you when you come forward. And you can find those details on our website. We do have like training manuals and things like that. So what I always recommend people to do is to go through all that knowledge that's already there on the website. Because we have a, a whole slew of different um, training manuals and guidance to, 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 to explain exactly how you develop your SHI. But fundamentally, you as youth in property, I, I presume there's a lot of young people who are either you're active in the property sector or you're active in it, you would need to have some sort of knowledge within this sector, you know, just to demonstrate the ability to understand what it is you are doing here. You are partnering, partnering with SHRA to deliver rental housing, affordable rental housing, to make it specific. But you need to know exactly what the product is, what you're doing. So therefore, every other thing that we require from you then boils down to um, you know, your, your case as a business, we would require your business plan and things like that. And as an entity that might not have the experience, what we do, like Diervald said, we don't just send you away, you don't have what we need, but demonstrate to us, okay, may, maybe you don't have the experience, but then show us between now and the next five years, your five-year business plan, let, show us what it is you are going to do as an SHI. How are you going to be successful, sustainable? You know, what is your intent? Where do you want to be active? who is part of your company, who's your team, and the areas where there's a shortfall in skills, what are you going to do to fill up those skills, who are you going to appoint, who are you going to engage, so on and so forth. So it's a, long, it's, it's a long list of requirements that we have, I must admit, but what we've done is to ensure that we are in a creating an enabling environment. We've got so much information available for you, and it's just for you to sit and go through each and every one of those details on our website. Now, in terms of your second question, in terms of what else can you learn aside from the need for funding, <laughs> um, I think more than anything, it's, a, it's an all-rounder, right? I think, you know, people get excited, you want to come into property and make money, but then it's also just learning exactly what this environment is about. Mm -hmm. You know, with social housing, you're dealing with low-income earners, you're dealing with social restructuring. There's a mandate here. It's not just about, okay, you want to develop this project and move on. There's also that social aspect. What are you doing to provide an adequate uh, uh, form of housing for our beneficiaries? You know, people who are trying to get closer to opportunities. That's the point of social housing. It's rental housing for those who, you know, you need to be employed, of course, to afford rent. But we're trying to get rid of this, the, the dynamic in South Africa where so many of our citizens you know, wake up at the crack of dawn, you have to take two taxis to get to town, you're queuing and everything. In the, at the end of the day, you get home past sunset, you know, because of the challenges with transport. So when you've got a social housing project like Grand Central Towers that Yusuf is busy delivering right there in Midrand, next to the car train and all kinds of transport amenities and, and schools and the like, it's about knowing that your delivery here is more than just I'm trying to deliver housing and make money, but I'm doing something in South Africa. I'm, I'm, I'm contributing to the government's mandate to really change things in this country. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question. But just the third one, I might just then hand over to, to Linda Butler to, to just take us through um, what kinds of different sources of funding exist. And also then beyond that, um, as youth, how do you, what, what other sources of funding can you qualify for when it comes to owning property? Th th thanks, Nicole. Uh, okay, I don't, am I audible now? Okay, yes. great start. <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. Really, as already indicated, I'm coming from the NHFC, which is also an entity of the Department of Human Settlements. So there are various funding instruments that are available, but since this is a social housing environment, maybe I would say that, look, we'll focus on the social housing. So there are two instruments that are available for this particular sector from the NHFC. Firstly, is the debt financing, the simple senior debt financing, financed over a period of 20 years. So you approach the NHFC, you are accredited as an SHI or an ODA. The NHFC can be able to finance you with the 30% debt financing. So you would be aware that from the SHRA, you'd be able to access the 70% or up to 70% debt or grant financing that you can then use to be able to kickstart this project. So as an SHI, that should be able to fully fund your particular project as the NHFC will assess your cost and then be able to see your QSC, which is an instrument that you would have access from the SHRA. And then obviously on that cash flow, it will give us an indication 
of your income and expenses and when we just look looking for a situation where you are able to service all your monthly obligations so that would be your operating expenses as well as your debt obligation on a monthly basis so we're just looking for a debt service cover ratio of 1.1 meaning that you are generating sufficient revenue to be able to cover all of your expenses in the property management game so that's the first instrument the senior debt is amortized over a 20-year period and uh, during the assessment period i also just need to reiterate the fact that we are not looking for reasons to reject an application. So whenever that we'll see that, look, there's a shortage in terms of the, the board skills, the NHFC is able to approve a loan, and then we say subject to you, be able to, uh, maybe in your board of, uh, of directors in the particular company, that maybe you are lacking legal skills or property management skills, that we can say that, look, you need to then strengthen your board in this particular way. So those are all the recommendations that our board is able to then come up with. And then another instrument is equity financing. So let's take an instance where you're in ODA, it's already been indicated that you are required to contribute approximately 20%. That then limits your debt financing requirement to about 10%. So the NHFC is able to consider one, that see the debt financing component, but over and above that, we can be able to issue or be able to appraise your application for equity instruments. Our corporate finance, which is a not a new division per se, but uh, it's just been given a new twist in these days. So there are various other instruments like your junior debt, your mezzanine financing that can be considered for your project in order to be able to achieve financial viability. But it does not waive any requirement that you contribute something. So the NHFC can be able to potentially consider an element of that 20% equity financing to make sure that your deal does come through. So there are various instruments that will be able to consider for your deal. But outside of social housing, there are other programs that are available, maybe your private rental, which is unsubsidized, that we can have a discussion with uh, another day. But do engage me, and then we can be able to further the discussions. Thank you. Sorry, just to, just to add, um, I realize that we haven't really touched on the funding mechanism when it comes to SHRA. So perhaps maybe there's people in the room just wondering, okay, but you know, after Lindo Gushle mentioned that <laughs> NHFC will fund 30% and SHRA will fund 70%, just to break it down further, what SHRA does is offer a grant towards the costs of construction of your development, right? So it's a fixed grant. It's a grant of 328,000 Rand per unit. And depending on your development, that 328,000 per unit will have a, a varying impact. So say for instance, you're delivering um, 100 units and your total development cost is, is 50 million, just as an example, right? And if you just divide that and it turns out that per unit, it's approximately 480,000 Rand. That means that of that 480,000 rand per unit, Shra's investment is a grant of 300 to 328,000. So as you can see, whereas you would have been needing financing, debt finan financing, or whatever source of financing to cover 380,000 rand per unit, Shra's grant substantially reduces the amount of debt funding you would require, or debt and equity you would require. Because in normal instances, if you go to the private sector, when you're developing property, and you've got a 50 million rand project, your debt financier would require you to put up equity anywhere between as much as 30%, you know, equity. But when Shra comes in and says, well, we're funding a grant of 328 per unit towards a development cost of 480 per unit, you know, we've already brought down how expensive this development is with government funds. Therefore, that remaining 100 and whatever it might be, I don't have a calculator in my head, but whatever it might be, that portion there is what you're supposed to then fund with either equity or debt. That's where NHFC comes in. And as an ODA, that remaining portion, 20% of it would have been funded by you. So then in totality, you would see it as that 328 per unit coming from SHRA, it's about 68 and sometimes as much as 75% of your development costs. And then if you're an ODA, you would have added then 20% and then the debt funder would have added the balance. So that's how social housing works. It's a subsidy from government to bring down the cost of your development. So because we've reduced the cost of your development, you then are able to reduce the cost of the rentals. And that is how you rent out the development to people who earn as little as 1,850. That's how it works. So just to, to understand the mechanism and, and, and what is the benefit of being active in this sector is that Developing property is an expensive endeavor, but when you partner with government, it brings down that cost. And then the opposite and the benefit that we have is that 
South African citizens earning within that, tech, uh, that income bracket are housed. Thanks. Sheesh, I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Now, Mr. Justice, I'd like to bring you into the conversation before passing the mic on to our next question. As we know, in South Africa, we know we have a lot of debates around the land issue, and I saw that HDA deals with land requisition and release. So can you please explain the role in social housing that you play? Thank you, <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, and good morning. I hope I'm audible. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, uh, I work for the Housing Development Agency. It is an agency which is owned 100% by government. We report to the Ministry of Human Settlements. And our main role is to facilitate the acquisition or release of land for human settlements development. Unfortunately, we facilitate the release of this land mostly to other state departments. Uh, or municipalities or metros, not necessarily directly to the private sector. Uh, the way in which uh, we do the facilitation, as you are aware, the government of the Republic of South Africa still owns quite a substantial uh, hectares of land in and around the country. Of course, the distribution of those land parcels varies from province to province. Mostly rural provinces still have vast tracts of land. Unfortunately, in Gauteng, where there is a greatest of the need, there isn't a lot of public land available, especially in well-located area. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we facilitate the release of these land parcels from the, mainly the Department of, uh, of Public Works and Infrastructure, as well as Rural Development. Sometimes we do facilitate the release of these land parcels from state-owned companies like Transnet, Unfortunately, some of those land parcels are well located within the, urban, uh, within the urban boundaries. But importantly, we also facilitate the acquisition of private sector land, which in the main is well located. Uh, I heard Dierwald alluding to the fact that they don't have any single social housing uh, project uh, within this printing precinct, which is Santa. <laughs> uh, we, of course, can facilitate that, but unfortunately, as you are aware, well, land, 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 land is very expensive in these parts of the world. We are, of course, empowered to do expropriation, but still we are required to provide a market-related compensation, which makes it very difficult for us to acquire land at reasonable prices within this area. Uh, Dear Val did touch a bit on our role in as far as the Shra is concerned. The Shra, of course, is our sister company. Uh, we all belong or we fall under the human settlement sector. So what we have been doing is to hold land for Shra in instances where they would want land to be banked for future release to SHIs. So far, we do have one or a few land parcels that we're currently holding, and we have one which is in the process of being released to a successful SHI which has tendered to the Shra, located somewhere in the Western Cape. Of course, our relationship is still at, in, at its infancy. We, we would want to really play much more bigger role in holding the land for the Shra because as Devalt has said the Shra is not mandated to hold property. We, on the other hand, can hold property for short-term, medium-term, and long-term release. So hopefully, uh, on all those land parcels that we are holding, we, uh, we hope that when the Shra, of course, is facilitating the release of those land parcels to SHI, uh, and which is their, entirely their process, uh, we hope that of course, they will look kindly upon you as the youth and make sure that you have access to land parcels, those land parcels. Because for me, as you are aware, as much as we can talk about entrepreneurship and projects, without land, you are not going to be able to do anything. So I think land is very, very critical. And in fact, it's, it's one of the most expensive component. And without it, uh, it really becomes difficult for any project to get off the ground. Unfortunately, as the HDA so far, we don't have any active program where we release land to youth 
uh, at a song, hopefully, so that you are able then to have that initial capital in order to leverage other funding to do your projects. It is something that as the HDA, we are hoping uh, through our uh, transformation department uh, to come up with a solid program which would enable us to release parts of the state land to not only youth, of course, but to other disadvantaged groups as, as women, such as women and, and generally to, uh, BE companies uh, mm -hmm. so that they can have access to this very precious commodity called land. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I believe we have a question in the audience. Um, Do you mind standing? Okay. My name is Sapoma Diva. I'm a, I'm a developer. And uh, I want th my question is, how do you assist a developer that is already developing um, and established in, this, in some way? Uh, you have the land. I have the cap capability of the building because I own a construction company. How do you assist me to, find, to, to fund the project going forward? Number two will be, uh, the number two of the questions will be, um, if you have equity, uh, your own funding equity, how do you then assist in terms of the grants or trying to break the red tape uh, and avoiding the long route of the government land and all that? Uh, the number three is that how is how is Shrad different uh, in terms of gap market, the gap market and um, the, the flesh market? Because if we can f we can easily fall into the RDP spectrum if it's starting from one thousand and to to twenty two thousand. Uh, so and you have thirty percent of that. Uh, because I believe you have a project in Pretoria, which is in the court stage uh, from Shra, that uh, is being attacked by the community, that this is a government project, uh, it belongs to us, uh, we need to occupy it uh, because it's government and it's, it should be free, not rented. How do we then avoid the security part of that uh, when we're developing through, through Shra or through NF NF NFC? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Tepo, may you please repeat question two? I didn't quite get it. The, the security, uh, the gap market, actually. The, the, because I'm saying what you are developing as SHRA, how is it different from the gap market? Oh, wasn't that question three? Unless I, I thought you had three questions. So the okay. first one was uh, regarding ex helping existing developers who do have land, so on and so forth. Yeah. And I know that question three is about the difference between Gap and Flisp, and what, what is it that Shrai? Okay. So that I, be, I thought I missed the second question. Okay, the, the, I'm saying that is the last one that you yes. missed, I guess. Uh, the security part, when we're developing the, the Shra spectrum, okay. how do we avoid it to be attacked by communities in terms of wanting it to be free, not being rented? Right. For example, you have a land in Tembisa. Uh, Maybe you have a hectare in Tembisa or closer to Tembisa. You, d you, you then get approved to develop. Mm -hmm. And then you put uh, the Shra board there, mm -hmm. and then people start believing that it's RDPs and they stop the project. Mm -hmm. That happens. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So just to answer the first question, I think um, the challenge really just is about awareness when it comes to social housing. I think quite often we realize that there are a number of developers who just simply don't know about SHRA um, and, and hence there's that question, well, how do I get into this sector? You know, they don't really know much about it. And more than anything, as a developer who's already active and as a developer that has land and the intent to bring forward a new project, there really isn't a barrier to entry in this sector. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all for you to just acquaint yourself with our investment criteria and just ensure that you meet our requirements and then for you to come forward to SHRA and we, we get the process going. So as a developer with a piece of land that you've identified, the first thing I always re recommend is for 
for our developers to check whether that land parcel is located within a restructuring zone because those, that's one of our um, investment criteria. So because this program is fundamentally mandated to restructure our urban areas and avail affordable housing within the urban areas, you can't develop anywhere you please. You know, if you come now with a property that's in the middle of nowhere, it's not near to any kind of inner city or whatever the case may be, it would not fall in a restructuring zone, therefore you can't bring it forward to Shrya. Um, so there are gazetted restructuring zones in and around South Africa. So Joburg CBD is, is within a restructuring zone, for example, uh, Midrand, we've got various areas around the city, I'm, I'm only naming a few because I don't know it off by heart, but there's many, Benoni, Kempton Park, Germiston, whatever the case may be if we're talking about Joburg. But that's the first thing you need to do. You need to check if that land that you have is located within a restructuring zone. If it is, then all it is is for you to then provide Shrub with the development concept. What exactly are you trying to build on this property? How many units? What is the unit typology? One bed, two bed, bachelors, whatever the case may be. We also, another one of our investment criteria is that it has to be medium to high density. So we don't do standalone properties because this is not, you know, that part of the department's uh, uh, housing provision. This is social rental housing, therefore it needs to be medium to high density, a multi-unit development. Another investment criteria is that it has to be self-contained units. We don't do communal facilities, you know, like res or whatever the case may be. It must be self-contained units, the bathroom and kitchen and everything must be inside. Um, it must meet our beneficiaries, the income earners, meaning that your rentals must align to those of the social housing sector. So once you go through all those items, which I believe was an earlier question from where it comes to how do we learn more, that you go through our website and just see exactly all those things that I've just mentioned now, our investment criteria, see if your project aligns and if the development concept you have meets what we require. You come forward to Shra and we can at least assist you in that regard. Another one of our important investment criteria is that the municipality and the, and the province needs to support the project. You know, they endorse the project at what, you call, what we call a provincial steering committee. This committee sits on a quarterly basis throughout the year and what you do is present your, your project to the municipality wherever it's located. If it was here in Joburg, you would present it to the city of Joburg, um, you'd, you'd submit it to them, show how it meets their requirements to restructure, social, economic benefits, so on and so forth. They would provide you with an endorsement letter and then you'd be able to present it to the province during the st project steering, uh, provincial steering committee. So those two items, that's also one of our important ones, but it's not impossible to get that support. Like I'm saying, you just bring your project forward, you present it, and once you have the various investment criteria met, that's when you have a viable social project in, in uh, you have a potentially viable social housing project, and then you will go through our assessment processes to the point where you will end up qualifying for approval. So yeah, please definitely acquaint yourself with the details on our website, but come forward, really. We, we need more youth-owned entities to come forward to Shra. It's part of our targets, our annual targets. We need to award the grant towards various entities, youth-owned entities, women-owned entities, black-owned entities. So mm. we need you guys to come forward. So please, if there's any further information you might need, you feel free to come through. Um, and then in terms of the difference between GAP and FLISP, I think I alluded to it earlier, just in terms of social housing is rental. That's the fundamental difference because FLISP and, uh, is ownership. I believe GAP might be ownership, right? Yeah, GAP is ownership as well. So I don't know, Lindo, if you want to add anything towards this question. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm. Okay, look, uh, yeah, as Nkolo has indicated, look, the, the, the GAP and uh, the SHRA model is very different. As you would see on your Q&A, there is a brochure that I saw there. Uh, the SHRA model is just for renting in perpetuity there is no ownership at a later stage for owning that particular unit. And I think it goes to consumer education. Those are, uh, it also speaks to the rental boycott to say that it's for 
engagement with the municipalities, with all the stakeholders, so that there's consumer education, that they understand the model, that this particular one, it's not uh, your PNG units or your RTP housing units. These are for rental. And if there's no rental, that means that it, it will dilapidate. It will not be maintained because you need that income in order to, to maintain. So FLISP is just for first-time homeowners. It's for people that would have to buy a, a unit, maybe a two-bedroom unit in Katlehong and if you're buying your first home. It's there to just reduce your outstanding balance. So let's say that you've been approved by FNB. FNB has approved your home loan and then you are earning below 22,000 Rand. So there is a cascading balance that says that if you are earning X uh, as your gross income, then you get a reduction or you get a grant which is paid towards your home loan. So it's just there to reduce the outstanding or the eventual mortgage amount that is advanced by the financing institution. So it's very different models. So you just need to make sure that there is somebody that is a, a community liaison officer uh, in your particular project that will be just uh, making sure that the community understands that this is a rental model. And in order for you to be able to qualify, there is a vetting process which you need to follow. And then there is a lease that is entered between yourself and the, the SHI or the ODA that is managing that particular development. So it's a very uh, different uh, model that is there. Uh, yeah, maybe you can take over the other. Yeah, so in terms of your last question, in terms of protecting your development from hijacking, so it is one of the risks in this sector. Um, it's highly politicized as well. Um, and what Lindo mentioned is true, where our grant recipients, we always insist that there is tenant training as well. You train them. To, 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 to understand exactly what their obligations are and what rental is. This is not just a unit that's for free, but this is what your rent does. It keeps this roof over your head. It pays for A, B, and C. Um, but aside from that, in the risks associated with hijacking, I, I mean, I'd like to hand over to Yusuf, you know, as a, as a SHI who's experienced that, that kind of ex uh, uh, situation when it came to rent boycott and the like. It's a very huge challenge in social housing. So, Yusuf, if you could share your it's story It's a difficult question. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, if, if you take, for example, what Jirval said earlier, the role of the SHRA is an enabler and a regulator. So the enabling part means, you know, we're going to give you the grant. And uh, the regulator, leg, regulator element is that, you know, we're going to un understand if you are following the legislation and the following the guideline. And there's merit in all of that. You know, uh, sometimes as a developer, we can feel frustrated and say, look, you know what? We want to give this project, the, 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 the construction of this project to uh, contractor A because we know that contractor A will do the job for us and, 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 and they'll deliver it because they delivered uh, project Y, Z, and whatever it is. Uh, but the SHRA may come back and say, look, in our experience, we feel that project uh, contractor A is not the right guy because he doesn't demonstrate his ability to have financial, uh, uh, financial competence, et cetera, et cetera. And that might be frustrating, but there's merit behind that. And the reason for that is because, for example, when you have the security concern, take, for example, the, um, the incident where you come onto site and, you know, your building is stopped because, unfortunately, uh, the community is of the view that this is a government project, so they should be doing the, the, the construction. But you've already signed with uh, TriStar Construction, for example. Now, that's where, you know, as a developer, you've now outsourced and, and got the best people on board for your project. And the SHRA is a, a rubber stamp that, for example, you've got an architect that is competent and is able to do this and has expertise, a quantity surveyor, et cetera, et cetera, and also a contractor. So when those sort of, when, when, when those sort of incidents um, uh, present themselves. You have taken a risk mitigation strategy to put it into the JPC con JPCC contract to say the contractor, you are experienced in this and you, it will be your responsibility to engage with them to ensure that they understand that this is not a government project, it's a privately owned project. And of course, 30% of the work must be given to the community. So we will do that. But that's basically, and, and that has to be based on certain requirements. For example, you know, there's got to be, the, if, we exp, if we're hiring uh, uh, bricklayers, etc., they've got to have the necessary expertise. We've got to pay market-related rents, etc., and they can assist to manage that process as well. So I think there's a lot of merit behind what the SHRAS processes are uh, when it comes to, to doing that. But ultimately, 
ultimately the risk is on the developer's shoulders because as a developer, that's, that's what we have to do, but we have to have risk mitigation strategies in place to ensure that we can deal with those issues. We have, for example, on many occasions been stopped. I was just telling Devout now, we're starting a project, um, in, in, you know, uh, and, and it, it hasn't even been approved, but to be proactive, we've just been doing a geotech. We authorized the geotech investigation, which means that, you know, the TLBs, et cetera, has to come to site, dig underground and get samples. The minute they arrived there, 20 minutes later, they were stopped. And, you know, we had to explain that this is just an investigation and we haven't yet started the project. It's, it's, so it's an engagement as well. And there's an understanding that, you know, once the project is uh, approved and we start a project, we will engage with the community. The 30% will be allocated. We'll ensure that we have X amount of women uh, entrepreneurs involved, youth entrepreneurs, etc. So that engagement is very necessary. However, it's important to understand that it is on our shoulders as a developer and not on the Shra's uh, shoulders to, um, to, to ensure that that, is, uh, that risk is mitigated. And even when it comes to running, that's why, uh, you know, it, when, when I said grit, it's persever perseverance and passion because all of these challenges do come along when you least expect. For example, we launched a state-of-the-art project and uh, it was really what was called a flagship project and there was a rental boycott and a hijacking of the building. You wouldn't expect that to happen because it doesn't form the, the you know, your, your, your run of the mill, can I say, hijacking which takes place in an in, in a CBD. You picture something that is derelict, something that's, uh, you know, hasn't been taken care of. But here you're talking about a brand new building with state of the art technology for social housing, etc. and it got hijacked. So we have to deal with it. It took two years for us to iron hijack it, two years. And that's now, you know, day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out, we've got issues. But if you have a vision of success and you understand that you're doing this for the greater good of the community, the country, then it makes everything worthwhile. Because this sector, the social housing, is very unique. It's actually one of the most uh, uh, unique systems in the world because what, what, what it does is that, as, 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 as the panel says, it, it, you know, you take a family, you empower them from, from, from grassroots. So in other words, you earn 1,500 or 1,800 in a month, you come into our units, you pay 680 ren or 700 ren, you grow, you grow into a two bedroom where you pay a little bit more and then you go and buy your own home. So when you see that this is a direct impact business, what a direct impact business means is that you can develop the units and you can immediately see how you've changed somebody's life, immediately. So that gives you the motivation and the courage to continue despite all of these challenges that present themselves. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Um, if you, you sound like you are more in the integrated system uh, rather than uh, the, the breaking ground in the local, uh, lo lo in the locations like townships. You sound like you, it sounds like you are more into the cities and integrated system. Hence, you mentioned Santan. But um, I want to ask this question: uh, Most of the land is already taken in the city, or uh, in the urban areas. Uh, most of it. So, would you look at uh, existing buildings that are there? For example, um, there's a lot of buildings that are being sold on, or taken down in Pretoria, um, Sunnyside, for example. Uh, would you look at something like that? Would you look at something that it needs to be turned into social housing in yeah, terms of funding? I, I will take that question um, because I think why you hear that from Yusuf in terms of he's more in the urban areas and the like is, is what I mentioned earlier where the point of social housing is to take people out of the township and integrate them into the urban areas. You know, we're trying to get rid of that, 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 that history in South Africa where, you know, the disadvantaged or lower income earners are bound to, um, you know, the only option they have is, is the township where housing is more affordable. We're trying to make housing affordable in the city. Our citizens deserve to have affordable housing close to work and close to opportunity schools and the like. So that's why a lot of our social housing projects, they're not necessarily inside the township, they're more closer to the, the urban areas and so on and so forth. Um, but just to answer your question, yes, we do accept projects. We call them brownfield projects. So a greenfield project is when you are building from the ground up on a vacant property. 
Um, and a brownfield project is when you are purchasing an existing property and refurbishing it um, for residential use. So whether you're refurbishing an office into residential or it's existing residential that you are improving, of course, because our, our requirement is that what we invest in, we obviously want it to be quality. It needs to be new. You're not going to buy an old residential building in the city and then tell us, yeah, here's your social housing. We're just buying this. You need to purchase it, refurbish it, touch it up completely, you know, bring it to, we call it as new as possible. So that means you will take it in, you'll, you'll address any kinds of issues and wear and tear over the years, uh, water damage, mold, whatever the case may be, you can even improve it. We have a lot of our entities, they buy these buildings, they reconfigure the inside envelope. So maybe say, for instance, this property had um, 120 units, but all of them were like these tiny micro units. So then someone purchases that building, they break down those walls, turn it into maybe two bedrooms, one bedroom bachelors, completely overhaul it. So um, we do accept that as a project type because indeed where land is, 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 is unavailable, at least properties are there across the city, across South Africa. So we, whichever region it may be, Joburg, East Rand, Kempton Park, um, even Western Cape, Durban, whatever the case may be, as long as it's in a restructuring zone, just by the way. But yes, we do accept that. Uh, last one, um, just for an understanding. Mm. Uh, if the building is therefore in, in the city, um, obviously the cost of reconstructing or reconfiguring it will be high. Mm -hmm. um, would you accept in the modeling the IBTs? Um, like alternative building technologies? Yes. Yes, of course. So um, more than anything, when you look at the difference between a greenfield and a brownfield, right? So with a greenfield project, the cost drivers on a greenfield actually is the land most, most often, but it's not as high as with a brownfield where you're not purchasing the land alone, you're purchasing the land with a built form on top. So it, it's inverse. So here we have a very expensive building to purchase, and then the building costs are, are less, Meanwhile, in the green field, the land is not the highest cost. It's actually the construction because it's brand new. So in this instance, with trying to keep your costs low, we do accept building alternative building technologies as long as they are certified. Um, so I think in South Africa, it's your agreement certificate. And we, we actually welcome it. It's part of also our targets to also address environmental and sustainable uh, uh, considerations these days. And also uh, in general, when it comes to green building as well. Guys, we want you to consider solutions that will make, you know, the cost of living lower for our beneficiaries. We want solar, we want maybe just uh, water harvesting using a borehole, whatever the case may be. Solar geysers are a, quite a predominantly used item in social housing projects just to alleviate the cost of electricity and services for our end users. And um, with the ABTs, I think so far we've only, we, it's, it's only a few projects that have implemented, but most recently we just approved a project in CBD in this first, well, in between January and March where they're purchasing an existing building and they're turning office into residential and they're using a, an alternative wall, walling technology. So we even went to go and verify that technology. We wanted the certificates and all of that. And we went to go and see the supplier. We went to go and see how um, on site that that material how does it how does it work how do you install it how does it feel we don't want people to cut corners we've seen some, certain projects not in our program but in <laughs> other projects we've seen people try and use partitioning as a wall for the units and you can't do that because partitioning is not soundproof so it's things like that where we check what are you trying to bring us is it is quality is it certified and will our beneficiaries be happy with this because you don't want to build something and then you have people who move in and immediately they're ready to move out because they're just not happy. This, this is not good or this is not great. Uh, sometimes also even expenses. They're like, yes, you've subsidized our rental, but now our utilities are still expensive and we can't afford this, whether it's like electricity or water. Hence, we're saying come up with good solutions, solar geysers, so on and so forth. Thank you. We've got one question in the audience and we're going to then break for tea. Um, good morning, guys. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Vosi. I'm from the Eastern Cape, from El Kabeja. Vosi is my home girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just want to find out. Um, last year, I bought a property that is um, 300 and um, 320 square meter. 
Um, it was a house. Um, I've demolished it, broke it down. I just had an architect who did um, the growing plans and everything. I just want to find out, um, are you guys able to come in in that process? Because I haven't built anything. I just have the growing plans. And he told me um, the number of um, units that can come out from there. And then just another thing, um, you know, some of us are really trying to improve the townships. You know, I feel like us young people of this generation, we're trying to turn the township into these urban areas. Not mm. most of us want mm. to move out of the townships. So I think with your guys' help, with what I'm trying to do, you know, we can really establish that you can, can bring class um, in the township because there are many projects that are taking place, especially in the Eastern Cape and Kabecha. They are building malls in the townships. You know, you have Abu Kruwets, Ekas, you know, those things you don't see. Um, I just wanted to find out at the stage that I'm at, um, if you guys are, you know, can interject and just assist me with that. And also, I just wanted to find out the time frame. Um, since I'm already in the process of that, I would just like to find out the process that you guys take. Um, how long does it take? Um, yeah, I think that's all. Uh, all right, thanks. Maybe let me start uh, off this time. Look, I would be interested in terms of the number of units. You know, with the rental model, one always has to be cognizant of something that uh, economies of scale at some point are required. So maybe the number of units, are you aware how many units? Yes, yes. Um, so um, the guy said um, it can be 16 units. So it's going to be a double store. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's going to be eight um, on ground, and then the first floor will also be eight. So it's going to be 16 units. Yeah, L look, I, I would be interested in looking at the financial model to see if you are able to generate sufficient revenue. Because for a rental model, uh, the number of units does make uh, some sort of a difference. So it mm -hmm. just uh, a financial model would, would then be able to, to indicate that. I don't know whether the SHRA, maybe they will indicate if they do have a threshold to say that, look, minimum size number of units is X, but they will indicate on that. And then with regards to the township development, yes. One other requirement that is there for uh, the development is that a market study needs to be done to say that is there demand, at what level is the demand in that particular area. So it could be that maybe a social housing is not appropriate for that area. So mm -hmm. there are various avenues. It could consider private rental. One of the subsidiaries of NHFC, I don't know, it's also common in Kabecha, it's called Umastand under TAF. Yes, so you can yes. also be able to consider something of that sort to be able to assist uh, with that regard. And then in terms of the time frame to obtain an approval, it all depends on the uh, loan amount when it comes to the debt funding component because uh, there are various sanctioning committees. At the NHFC, our CEO is able to approve up to 15 million rand. She has that delegation of authority. And then up to 50 million, then it's approved by our management, which would be formed by our executive committee, which sits every two weeks. So once you've submitted an appraisal, a proposal has been drafted, it gets tabled to that committee. If it's above then 50 million, it has to be recommended by this management committee to a subcommittee of the board that meets once a quarter. They approve up to 200 million. So then the turnaround time could be then up to three months. But it also depends on the availability of information. Uh, the, the, as the SRA indicated, that there's quite a, a comprehensive list of documents which are required in order for the NHFC to be able to further the process. So it, it's dependent upon yourself, availing the information that is required for the sanctioning committee. But it would range anything between a month and up to about uh, a quarter which would be three months, depending on the loan amount and the availability of information. If there are queries, obviously, that arise, we do also rely on you to be able to provide that relevant clarity. Maybe if there are financial statements that you've submitted and there are queries on the no to say that, look, what is meant here? So there is that interaction, that inter interactive session that we will be having on a as and when required basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But can I just also just, um, just one last question? Um, is it possible, let's say, um, I do get funding. Um, I've already engaged with um, Omar Standi, mm -hmm. um, with UTAF. Um, I I'm just, just want to find out with you guys. Let's say I do get funding. Um, is it possible that I can get back um, the money that I have purchased the property with? Um, I don't know. 
Look, on the, on the private rental side, you remember that there's also some equity contribution. Mm. Now, this is not a social okay. housing model. Okay. There is some equity contribution. So you don't get that money back maybe up until such time that you've repaid the facility okay. back fully to the NHFC. So it depends at what level of gearing the loan to value. Have you contributed 10%, 20% equity? And then the NHFC obviously finances the up to 90 or 80% okay. on the private rental model. Social housing would be a bit different uh, on that case. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think I just concur exactly with how it's been explained. But I just wanted to also highlight that with our requirement for your project to be medium to high density, our threshold is quite high. Like we, we look for at least maybe above 75 to 80 units upwards. So, so this one is quite small at this time, but it's like Yusuf was saying, you know, just starting where you are and you continue growing until that time where, you know, you're 16 turns into 20 to 30, 50 one day you're going to reach that 100 threshold and you can definitely come forward. Thanks. Thank you. And Mr. Yusuf, I'd like to bring you in for some closing remarks with regards to the message of how we can bring the youth back into this conversation. Okay. Uh, firstly, I just want to say how inspired I am to be here today. Uh, just looking at the youth makes me energetic already. Um, and I think that just because you are here already is already a, a huge step into progress into the sector. So uh, persevere into whatever you need to do. Start the process, even if it's a few units. Go into the, uh, you know, there's organizations like NHFC, Houting Partnership Fund, TUF, who will fund the smaller projects as well, um, you know, if it meets their criteria, so that you can get to the 100 units, so that you can approach the SHRA and the NHFC to continue your journey in social housing. So um, well done to you all, and, and, and I wish you all the success uh, in this journey. It is a journey. And Mr. Justice, I heard you accept the challenge that there will be transformation even at HDA. Is there any closing remarks that you have? Um, for me, uh, it is quite an eye-opener because uh, this is the first time I attend a youth event. I'm quite uh, encouraged by the questions that have been put forward. I can see that the youth are hungry for entrepreneurship. Of course, some of us uh, are not in the entrepreneurship space. We are working for government, but it's quite inspiring to see our young people uh, prepare, prepare to take the plunge uh, into the uh, exciting but very risky uh, terrain of uh, entrepreneurship. On the part of the HDA, uh, I think our program on youth is maturing. We have a fully fledged department that is currently running that, and we're intending to partner with uh, other state institutions where we are facilitating agreements with uh, uh, funding organizations within the state, where through those programs, we are, of course, going to try to find a way in which we can get youth be involved the youth to be involved in our projects and i think for me as the person who mainly deal with issues of land acquisition and release i would be quite happy to see a situation where the hda is very active in facilitating release of land to youth uh, entrepreneurship organization at um, amounts which i wouldn't say for free but at at a reasonable uh, purchase prices, which would enable the youth really to leverage land uh, for other projects such as social housing or gap housing or any other uh, program out there which they can engage in uh, in order to, of course, contribute into the uh, growth of the economy of this country. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give that a round of applause. I'd like to thank our esteemed panel for the insights that they've given us. I think for me, what was absolutely so powerful to see is how you all passionately speak about it and you don't have notes mm -hmm. in front of you, which really shows that this is something that you're doing on a daily basis, but are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I know that we want to continue the spirit of ensuring that we engage and ask questions. So even during tea, the team is here to 
answer your questions. So feel free to continue to do so, but you will continue to have an opportunity throughout the day to ask more questions. So thank you once again for today. I definitely know that the youth's potential is absolutely unlocked with just the knowledge we've received in the session. Let's give that a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I know the photographer would love a photo, so if you guys can please come together.